and then there are, are over the past decade several genetic models which are very intriguing because we do have human diseases that have genetic causes however for the most part again looking at things like um, Parkinson's disease or the Huntington's disease models we often don't see the clinical features that you would typically expect and oftentimes the pathological features aren't recapitulated within the animal model so again I think there's a lot of issues in terms of how we use preclinical models and how we interpret those data as potentially predictive for clinical trials. So other issues that could affect the translation of um, preclinical data are issues about the drug properties. Does the intervention get to the target? So for neurological disorders, does it actually get to the root blood or barrier to the brain? And does it engage the target when it gets there? And does it get there in sufficient concentrations? There are now very many um, studies looking at antibodies, and we know that for antibodies crossing the blood brain barrier, it's less than 1%. So even if it gets there, if it engages the target, is it there in a high enough concentration to actually mediate it in effect? And is it biologically active when it gets to the target? And also, is the dose sufficient? And I think we've had lots of discussions about dose funding studies, and there are um, issues to think about with these preclinical studies and trying to use those data to translate into dose funding for the clinical studies as well. And Dietrich will talk more about um, the toxicity issues as well as how to identify maximum tolerated dosages and how that helps with design of the trial. So another issue in terms of difficulties with translating preclinical studies is the lack of reproducibility. So there are several studies that have been looking at this and several um, efforts to try to improve this, which I'll talk a bit more about. And a lot of these are focused on issues surrounding the clinical, um, sorry, the preclinical study design also the lack of transparency in reporting where people don't include all the information that you need to be able to try to reproduce their data. And also publication of results. Typically negative results don't get published. You'll see positive results, but you have no information to, to better understand the full picture. So you're probably asking, gosh, you know, I'm a clinician. Should I really be caring about this preclinical animal research? This is a paper that was published by someone at NIDS, Shai Silverberg, and it really emphasizes the need for clinicians understand the preclinical data and for clinicians to, to be able to trust that the rationale for moving into the clinical trial is sound. And this really reflects upon the quality of the data presented in the preclinical studies and how those studies were designed. So there are several studies that have looked retrospectively at the ability to research this data and there's been a lot of issues um, in terms of being able to demonstrate reproducibility across um, this raises the question of, as a consumer of preclinical research, as a clinical investigator, how are you able to, to know that those are well-designed studies? How do you evaluate those studies so that you can ensure that they're going to be applicable to the trial that you want to design? So I now want to talk a little bit about some of the issues and some of the data about reproducibility in, in preclinical studies. And again, these focus a lot on the design of the preclinical study and also how the data are reported. So I found this to be a, a very interesting uh, publication in Nature from 2012 where Amgen, which is a big biotech company, tried to reproduce data. So they looked at 53 papers, which were being landmark studies, and then when they tried to replicate them, they found that they were only able to reproduce 11% of the studies, and, and they view this as, as a shocking result. And I think that really you know, should make people take a step back and think about what the data are that they're basing their clinical studies on. So what are the potential factors that are contributing to this lack of reproducibility and difficulty in trying to see to the same results that others have found? So this is a, coming from a paper from um, Francis Collins and, and Larry Tabak at Nature, the um, director, deputy director of NIH. And they tried to address some of these reproducibility issues. And this is, I think, it's a very short publication probably worth looking just to sort of understand the NIH perspective. And so there's a thought that there's insufficient training experimental design, be that preclinical or clinical. I think courses like this are really a, a great step forward in trying to make sure that people have the appropriate training to critically analyze these types of data. Also, when looking at the types of information that get published in papers, there's an increased emphasis on making provocative statements and not necessarily presenting all the boring details of the data, but really wanting to, to have a big impact on the people who read it, like those headlines that, that I took from various um, news articles. And also there's oftentimes an over-interpretation of sort of creative hypothesis generating experiments So people will sort of make big leaps and drop conclusions, which then if you see this in science or nature, you think, well, gosh, this is, you know, a 
fantastic study. It's in the top journal. It's probably a good enough quality for me to make my clinical trial decisions. And also, as I mentioned, many publications don't include the information that would allow another researcher to be able to replicate their studies. They'll have a lot of information in there, but not the, the details that would enable someone else to actually do the same experiment with the same parameters. And there are certain issues that really should be considered when looking at preclinical studies. Again, as I mentioned, negative data often are published, and I think over time there's now more of an effort to try to make those kinds of results available so that people get a full picture rather than some of a biased view of just seeing the positive results. Also, there's very few publications that will address the limitations of public studies or the scientific flaws of published results. People aren't going to want to point fingers at other people's papers, and therefore things that people may have tried to replicate and can't, we never hear about potential reasons why those studies didn't work. And also, um, the ability to access unpublished data. There are more and more efforts to try to make these types of data accessible, but people tend to hang on to their data, certainly um, within companies. There's also um, approaches to try to help the unpublished data become more accessible so that people can utilize those data to better inform their subsequent studies. And so based on these types of findings from the literature, the lack of reproducibility, the difficulty in finding data, NIH has a huge effort to enhance reproducibility. And there's certain elements that they've decided where preclinical studies really are critical to think about, basically blinding, randomization, <coughs> replication, sample size populations, as well as the effect on sex differences. And these are things I think that as clinicians and clinical researchers, we think about for clinical trials. But those same principles should apply to preclinical studies to make sure that they are as rigorously done as a clinical study. And if they're not, you really, I think, should take a step back and think, are these data sound enough for me to, to proceed with a clinical trial? So this slide is just emphasizing some of the data when looking um, at the types of preclinical methods that are used in preclinical studies. So this is um, a paper summarizing publications from seven scientific journals that had greater than 500 citations each. So clearly these were big impact studies across the time period of 1980 and 2000. Um, and they were from a pointer, but you can see at the bottom, in terms of the percent of studies that included blinding or adjusting for multiplicity or including randomization are all less than 20%. So I think this shows that there really are significant issues that have been identified in the preclinical research publications that really make you need to rigorously look at the data that you're using. So as I mentioned, there are significant efforts to try to address this <coughs> and improve the reproducibility of data transparency of reporting, and also address some of the methodological issues that we see in the preclinical studies. So there was a, a meeting um, back in 2012 or so um, organized by NIDS, which pulled together people from academia, government, and industry, which really called for improvements in the way that data are reported. The main hope of being able to improve preclinical research that's currently being published. And based on this, and this one checklist comes from Nature, but there's also a similar um, checklists for other journals to try to make sure that as people submit their articles and as people review their articles that these parameters that we've been discussing are actually included within the publication. And at NIH there's been a very large effort to try to improve the reproducibility of studies. This is sort of referred to as rigor and reproducibility. I encourage you to look at the websites that are um, available through NIH and all you need to do is Google rigor and NIH and you'll come up um, with this website. And then there's also a blog by the um, Director of Extra Mail Research where they answer common questions. And I think as you're beginning to do um, your grant applications, especially for NIH grants, there are certain features here that you'll want to pay attention to as you look back at the grant data. So there's a, a notice from NIH um, in 2015, and this included um, changes in terms of the instructions <coughs> and the review criteria, focusing again on enhancing the feasibility of research making sure that the premise for your research is based on sound scientific data. And these took effect in January and are included in multiple different funding announcements. And there are four areas that have been focused on. One is the scientific premise, so you want to make sure that the strengths and weaknesses of the published research on the data that you're um, considering really support what you want to do. And then additionally, you want to make sure that the preclinical data had a rigorous experimental design and rigorous methods, and these also apply for preclinical applications to 
make sure that people are designing their trials to meet these criteria. There should be consideration of relevant biological variables such as sex, and this should be included within the design as well as the analysis. And this applies again to both the preclinical as well as the clinical research. And then also there need to be methods to make sure that the um, biological compounds and the chemical resources that are being used are valid and can be identified and these apply to things like cell warrants and antibodies. And um, NIMDS prior to this NIH-wide announcement had come out with recommendations in terms of trying to ensure that preclinical studies were well designed and that there were efforts taken to have good animal models, that the studies were designed to minimize bias, that the results could be independent, repl independently replicated. And also, with many clinical trials, I think we have um, challenges demonstrating target engagement. And in the absence of demonstrating target engagement, and if you have a trial that ends up with a negative result, you really may be at a loss to understand if your drug really could be effective if we have been able to demonstrate target engagement. And also when interpreting the results, getting back to the point of people wanting to sort of have that high impact paper and making um, very large claims, just to make sure that the interpretation of results are valid and that alternate interpretations are also addressed. So the NIMDS clinical trial funding announcement specifically will reference um, the document that I just mentioned as well as the rigor guidelines with the hope that, again, you're focusing on looking at the preclinical data to make sure that make valid conclusions about those data before moving into your clinical trial. <coughs> and um, I just wanted to mention that there's actually a, a resource chart that if you Google resource chart and rigor, you'll be able to easily find. And this helps in terms of your grant application, where they would like to see each of these different features that we've been talking about included within the grant application, which I think should hopefully be a, a helpful resource. And so I think getting back to the question I asked you, should clinicians care about clinical animal research, and for no other reason, it's, it's required for your grant application to address these issues. But also, I think just to make sure you do as well the design study with the strong scientific premise that you really should reflect upon those data as you're considering your clinical trial. So um, in summary, um, I hope that I think we see that it's important to, to look at the preclinical data and really sort of think through um, some of the design issues. And that overall, NIH, as well as across the scientific community, that there have been efforts to really improve the design of preclinical studies, improve the transparency and reporting with journals, having many more requirements in terms of the data that are included, with the hope that this will improve reproducibility, and also to be able to critically assess scientific findings. So as you're looking at studies, it's important for you to think, was the study be a clinical or preclinical study designed appropriately? Has bias been minimized? <coughs> have the results that you're seeing been able to be replicated in an independent laboratory and have alternative um, you know, interpretations been considered? Unfortunately, 
Um, so uh, why is um, uh, non-clinical safety testing relevant? And this goes back to actually Chris's um, uh, introduction on, uh, on, on the first day in the morning, and it's basically a story that he already uh, pointed out, and uh, it started as uh, so often with a disaster, and uh, this exosulfonilamide uh, story that you heard from Chris, uh, basically just to uh, repeat or very briefly summarize it, this was a new drug that was formulated as an antimicrobial drug by a small company, uh, and they used a special um, a solvent, diethylen, uh, diethylen glycol, uh, and this was blended uh, with raspberry flavor, so everybody liked it, it tasted well, many people took it, and the first reports of uh, this compound's nef nephrotoxicity was already in the 30s, so, so, so about seven years uh, before um, this drug came on the market, but uh, it was not known to the company's chemist, so just a small company just didn't know about it. Uh, just happened to be went on the markets. There were no required preclinical testing at that time, and that led, as Chris already alluded to, and it's due to that disaster with over with the death of over 100 people in 15 states um, that died as a, um, a consequence of exposure to that uh, toxic um, solvent. So that led to uh, basically a publication in JAMA in 1938, where the whole story was summarized. It's a very interesting paper because it basically gave, gave a, a good overview about the story, how it came to that, and it, it did a nice job to do clinical experimental correlations. And what they ended up with basically is with nine recommendations. These are sm too small to read, but you can look them up on the slides then afterwards. So basically the authors end with, with very specific recommendation, what should be done in the future to avoid disasters like that. And if you go through the list of nine, there you, you can read things such as you know, you should have acute toxicity studies on a sufficient number of laboratory animals. You should have chronic to toxicity experiments with, in varying dose levels in different species. You should do careful and frequent observation of animals. Um, you should do pathological examinations. You should uh, look at the absorption and the elimination rate, for example. You should um, look at, um, you know, the possible influence of the presence of certain foodstuffs or drugs basically interaction, drug drug interaction. And look for idiosyncrasies or underwater uh, recommendations or uh, underwater uh, reactions. Uh, so that sounds somewhat familiar because that's basically turned into the Food and Drug um, Food Drug Cosmetics Act of 1938. Basically, and that's more or less um, uh, still valid to date. Uh, and this introduced the mandate of the FDA um, to look at preclinical safety uh, testing. So, if you um, look at this, uh, look at the IND form 1571 when we submit uh, to the to the FDA, we um, have all our interesting check marks here with with um, with the investigation plan, investigation investigative investigators brochure, and down here we see. Um, basically the non-clinical points here, chemistry, manufacturing, control data, pharmaco pharmacology, and toxicology data. So um, we often don't think about these check marks, and, and we hope that some other people have you know, done you know, uh, the work for us on that. But uh, if you are the IND sponsor, if you are the person that's submitting and signing this form, then you're responsible, and you're legally responsible. And you can actually get into legal trouble if you if if if, if, if you're not you know, fully aware of, of of what you know you submit to the FDA. So that's not it's a bureaucratic thing that you have to do. That actually really is that there are a few really hard uh, legal requirements. But that's one thing if you take if you write your name down there, you're the sponsor. You're you're responsible for that. So what do you, what should you know about your drug? So what is that CMC, Chemistry Manufacturing Control? So you should know um, your, what your drug product um, is composed of. And that's not only your actual drug substance. So we have to think about um, uh, excipients, impurities, and even the container. All that is relevant um, for, um, for, for um, you know, potential uh, issues. Solvents can produce toxicity. It's not your actual drug um, that, that, uh, that, that you put into your final drug product. So that's really important. You have to uh, know about the identity, about the strength, purity, and quality of your drug product. That's ideally everything that you should get from your company pharmacy if you have a company pharmacy at hand, um, uh, um, uh, or the supplier of the drug. You have to look at that. You have to read that. You have to make yourself familiar uh, with that. If you, if you have any questions, then ask whoever uh, is, is putting these packets together, that it's comprehensive. 
additional information are important. Who is the manufacturer? Uh, what's the storage uh, condition? What's the stability? Um, you might, you know, if, it's, if, it, if, it, if, it, if a study goes on for a while, you might have to worry about, um, you know, where do you store it? At what temperature do you store it? How do you, how do you, uh, you know, think about, you know, transport of drug from, um, you know, the, the the ER into the ambulance, into the into the, uh, you know, to the patient. You know, is the is the is, is the chain closed here? So that's something that that you have to, uh, you know, think about. Uh, pharmacology and toxicology. Um, Pharmacology, you know, there's, there's a long list here that, that you have to think about. It's the pharmacological effect, certainly the mechanisms uh, in animals, uh, the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, toxicology. All these um, tests are, um, uh, you know, usually done in a non-clinical uh, animal uh, setting. That's something that you um, might have to submit, might have to have available um, if questions arise. So, uh, when do you have to do that? Do you have to do all that before you submit your MD? Did I just throw you back for um, four years and five million dollars in your in your concepts? Not necessarily. When we think about the the, the, the development pipeline uh, from uh, from the drug discovery to the preclinical into the clinical phase, uh, usually what's what what is required for for early phase first in human first in patient studies really you know you have to have your chemistry manufacturing package together. Your drug that you submit has to with these standards. Um, some pharmacology information if you have in the acute toxicology if you do a short-term uh, administration study. Um, once you get into the clinical phase, there is still need for non-clinical uh, information and there might still be non-clinical uh, uh, aspects that you have to submit to the FDA in the development process. Once you change your formulation, for example, if there's a different lot, if you have a different manufacturer of your drug, make sure you inform FDA about that. Chronic toxicology, if you suddenly propose a study that goes over one year, um, uh, while your first time the opening study was a single dose administration study. So other toxicology evidence might be necessary at that point, reproductive toxicology, for example, or additional. So um, this is why um, if it really likes the term non-clinical and really does not like the term preclinical, because preclinical development basically implies that once you're in clinical phase, you're done with all that, but that's not true. So this is why basically the preferred term is here really the non-clinical development, because it goes all the way to approval and beyond. Um, um, so uh, why does post-clinical even matter? And there is an example um, of, of uh, many examples, but this is just one that you know you can pull up uh, pull up from the uh, from from the web. So this is a, a phase two um, randomized double blind control study in Huntington's disease of the compound that was reported last year being a successful uh, uh, phase two study, and they were ready to go into phase three, but then company had to put out um, a notice and you can't read that, but basically what, what it said that chronic toxicology studies uh, implied that uh, the dose that they wanted to use then in phase three actually had a potential safety signal and they limited the company to, to, to dose up to that high dose. So, so, um, so basically they were put on partial clinical hold, meaning that yes, you can dose up to a certain dose, but not up to the high dose. So, uh, but the high dose was the one that was deemed clinically useful. So, so, so this is why you know they were all the way to their Lancet paper, uh, but then basically non-clinical um, aspects, uh, you know, um, had, um, had 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 a say in the, in the future development program. Um, why do we need non-clinical docs data? Why do you need that? Um, first of all, uh, you want to determine whether your drug is actually safe to put uh, into humans. And you want to determine uh, what is your initial safe dose. This is really when, 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 once you put the, the, the drug the first time into humans, the first thing is you have to know what is, what is, what is a good starting dose. And you have to determine a safe uh, stopping dose. Um, Sometimes as well, when you when you um, look into dose escalation designs, you have to know uh, about potential dose limiting toxicities. You should not basically com be complete, completely in the gray of what to expect in the high dose range. You should do a, a focused safety monitoring about toxicities that have been seen in other non-clinical studies before, and um, you should. Um, uh, uh, use uh, you should you could assess toxicities that cannot assess in clinical trials in, in non-clinical studies if, if necessary. Um, the regulatory review again. I'm not speaking for the FDA, so that's 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 just um, you know. Uh, uh, but, but, but basically, um, if you um, have an off-the-shelf um, uh, FDA-approved drug, 
basically you can assume that the drug meets um, the standards for the maximum approved dose and length of exposure as uh, stated in the label. So, if, so, so from that point, you should be good. But if you consider using a higher dose, a longer uh, duration, different formulation, um, different route of, uh, of administration, for example, if they might ask you for additional uh, uh, safety um, uh, data on that. Again, IED um, opening is really only about safety. Um, and um, and uh, so, so, so that can be something that, uh, that they might come back to. Um, also, if you combine one, uh, or more than one drug, um, there might be um, a need for uh, individual studies and then combined studies um, uh, in the non-clinical setting. And uh, if you use the exact same formulation as basically as you know as it is off the shelf, then the label is basically sufficient to submit. Um, if you uh, get your drug from a different from 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 another sponsor, basically by, by manufacturer, you can obtain a letter of um, reference, basically a right of reference letter um, that um, uh, must support the plant dose and the route of administration. So, so if that if this sponsor already submitted the whole package to the FDA and you use that drug, then you can ask that sponsor to provide you a letter of uh, right of reference. So actually, you don't hold the information; it's basically at FDA and it gives the FDA folks the right to to, to look at that data set. So that's uh, that that should be sufficient if that supports your dose. Um, uh, if it's a dietary supplement, that can be tricky. Um, um, we were involved in many discussions about, you know, is that now a food or not? Is that a drug or not? Basically, it's not the this, this, this substance that makes it uh, a dietary supplement or, 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 or a drug. It's really the intended use, um, which makes it to a drug. If you use it to treat, to mitigate, prevent disease, then this is something that is basically the drug. So, um, you, um, so dietary su supplements, um, uh, they are not approved as drugs and therefore don't have an approved safe dose. You cannot automatically assume that they are safe. Um, uh, so uh, you might have to actually prove and, or, and you know, argue why you know, your dose is uh, safe in that, in that particular uh, population. So that's, 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 that's not an easy one. There's a very nice guidance on that on the studies with dietary supplements in this regard. But, 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 but the default should be assumed that it is a drug and that it's, uh, you need to submit an ID for that. If you make your investigation of drug by yourself, then generally you must provide a full set of the non-clinical pharmacology. Uh, it's always, um, um, and, and toxicology data, it's always a good idea to, um, to uh, call up the FDA, submit for a pre-ID meeting, for example, to really narrow down what exactly um, uh, would, would be required for me or whether there is any waiver for certain aspects of that. Um, so, um, the uh, next few slides are about really picking a starting dose. And that's often also for me been a very helpful um, um, uh, guide uh, from, from, from uh, the FDA to, 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 to have about an idea where should I go in with, with, uh, with my drug for the first um, study. In, um, in, in my patient population. You might not need any additional information if um, this is already approved and there's a, a dose, a FDA approved dose range available. Also, if you have data in the literature that supports your dose, um, animal data, human experience, for example, but the point is um, you have to be careful. Usually uh, publications are um, not um, sufficient or often they're not sufficient um, um, because you know they really look for you know how many animals were exposed to which to, to, to which dose level um, did they go um, how many humans uh, received the drug basically the absence of any report of any adverse events in the publication you know, does not necessarily mean there were not any adverse events so usually uh, basically you report that publications don't fulfill the, the formal requirements of, of, of toxicity reports that, that the uh, that the FDA likes if you get the actual data sets. That would be really helpful. Call up the, the author, maybe. maybe you can get really the, 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 the data set that you missed in the publication. Um, here's a very nice guidance. Again, guidance is sounds uh, really formal and, and very dry, but it's actually not. These are actually really nicely readable documents, a very short one. And there's a nice, uh, basically, guide to, to, to select your starting dose based on non-clinical data. And it's basically, this uses five steps. Um, the first step is, is, is to define the no observed adverse effect level um, in, in animals. And that's basically a benchmark for your safety. Um, and you, you have to use appropriate animal studies for that. And this can serve as a starting point 
um, uh, uh, from which you can derive a you know, reasonably safe starting point. And that's basically the highest dose uh, that does not produce um, a um, significant increase uh, in uh, adverse effects that are, that are relevant in, in, uh, for your uh, particular um, uh, uh, target group. So adverse events that are biologically significant is the highest, highest dose that did not produce any significant uh, adverse events in, in that uh, animal population. Uh, once you have that dose in your partic particular animal population, what you can do, you can convert it to a human equivalence dose, um, to a human equivalence dose. And um, these dose is really there to kind of go towards your um, to, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, yes, so, 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 so basically this human equivalent dose um, is based on uh, the fact that uh, these doses scale well between uh, uh, species and you can use uh, a, a, a table, sorry, there's a nice table in the, in the, in the guidance which lets you help basically convert your, your hamster dose to a human dose and is using basically a, a specific algorithm for that. Um, and um, then the question when you have several animal studies available, which one to choose? Um, and uh, factors that you should consider is, um, you know, is there any model, for example, most predictive um, of human toxicity? Um, uh, what are the difference, differences between these animal models? If you have no idea, then go for the lowest. The next is the safety factor. Why do we need a safety factor? Because we have many uncertainties, um, certainly. And, um, and, and and also you want to basically go in with a, with a good uh, margin of safety and the standard uh, default safety factor by FDA is 10 basically. Uh, meaning go for your lowest uh, human equivalent dose divided by 10 and that should be then your um, your safe starting dose. There are reasons to increase this dose for uh, this, this safety factor. For example, if there are non-monitorable toxicities, for example, you can also decrease it if, if this is a well, if the drug is in a well characterized class, for example. Um, but, but the default is, is 10. Um, the step five is a pharmacologically active dose. So if there's basically a dose that you already know that is pharmacologically active and that is lower than your human equivalent dose, then you might go for this pharmacologically active dose. Let me just run you through a quick example. Let's say you have um, uh, three non-clinical tox studies, uh, and this gives you an OIL uh, of 10 milligrams per kg in dogs, 50 in rats, and 50 in monkeys. Uh, what do you do? You convert it to the human equivalent dose, take this nice table from the guidance, and divide it by the uh, factors that are listed here. So you end up with 8, 8, and 16 milligrams per kg. Um, we have no idea what um, species is better in this regard. Let's assume that, uh, so we go for the lowest uh, human equivalent dose, this is 8, we divide it by the safety factor 10, so my maximum recommended starting dose would be 0 0.8 mic, uh, per kick in humans. If you're going with an explanation like that, you should, you should, you should be on the safe side. Um, there are certain limitations, as you can assume, this is a very mechanical approach. Uh, it's toxicity focused, it's less pharmacology based, it does not address those explanation, basically where should you end up, uh, what's, what's the, the stopping dose, um, uh, certainly does not apply to any local drugs, and it's not applicable to biolog not fully applicable to biologics because often you don't see um, any uh, significant safety profiles uh, in species that don't uh, express your specific receptor that you're targeting. For that, we can read up. There's there's the minimum anticipated biologic effect level, Mabel, you know, the new kid on the block, to to um, uh, of, of methodologies to, to to calculate biologic um, um, uh, starting doses. Um, last uh, um, two slides uh, is about clinical safety monitoring because that's basically the next step. Once you have defined your safe starting dose, you should really think about you know how do you measure for um, how do you monitor for for, for safety events because um, uh, you know um, you, you might uh, FDA might say okay this is actually a quite toxic drug not clinically but we let you basically do your first trial. To, to uh, as, as long as basically you really monitor very closely for, for toxicities um, uh, uh, in, in, in your study. So basically, um, any safety signal that you see now clinically uh, should be monitored um, in, in a clinical study, and you should always be vigilant about the unknown. And there's nice data on that that actually shows that, you know, that but, but the predictive um, value of non-clinical studies in terms of um, safety events, and uh, we know that basically that paper suggests that there's a positive concordance rate between animal and human toxicity about 70%.
So that means that 30% um, of human toxicities are not uh, uh, predicted in, in animal experiments. And if you plot them up by um, basically adverse uh, event uh, areas, you can see that uh, the blue bars are predicted in humans and the, and the, um, and, and the, and the green ones are, are in animals, that you know, there are some nice concordances here with gastrointestinal vomiting, for example. But um, you know, when it comes to headache, and dizziness, nausea, we see that in humans, not really predictive in animals, and others convulsions and, 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 uh, and, and ataxia are more present, um, at least in these uh, studies in animals. And if you look at uh, different species, you can see also that the predictive value is different between species. So, um, so the best predictive values here are dogs and primates, um, really unpredictive um, in terms of um, toxicities, uh, unpredictive are, are mice. So, so that's something to keep in mind when you, when you read your summary, um, or your executive summaries of the talk studies uh, that you get from your pharmaceutical company or from whoever who, who, who provides you the drug. So to summarize, if human data is lacking, um, non-clinical data is really crucial for, for your dose selection, for your safety monitoring, and also to, to, you know, to, to meet your regulatory requirements. And um, human data trumps uh, clinical, often non-clinical data. Um, if you have uh, um, not a complete animal tox toxicology study, but you can produce a study where your drug has been given to you know, a series of humans uh, somewhere, and that has been documented well, and you can show that, uh, then uh, you might be able to, uh, to go ahead with your uh, studies um, as non-clinical experiments are often very, very expensive. And, uh, and this is something that's um, really a key for, for, for your future planning of, of, of your clinical trials. Um, if, you're, if, if your compound is FDA approved, and you use it within the label, you should, be, um, um, you, 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 you should not have many of these problems, but um, these are um, important things to consider. And with that, I close and say, Thank you, and if there are any questions to Wendy or myself. Within, um, within the, the funding announcement. 
but there is a requirement that those data are available. <coughs> FDA has a requirement that data needs to be made available within a specified time frame as well. So I think from a clinical standpoint, things are being addressed. Um, and you know, there's a bit of a time period to let people publish their primary paper, but then there really is an effort to, to let things be more public. And I would just for the preclinical, it's it hasn't been a requirement to share those data, but I think people <coughs> recognize the importance, at least within publications themselves, to make it so that the, the study could be replicated without having to get confidence. But I mean, some people would say, even for clinical, why are you keeping data and publish it why The, the preclinical needs to be published. The clinical, usually, I mean, it takes a while to you know, get your publication done. So you don't want to do a whole study and then the day that you, you know, have all your results, put it out there and someone else could, you know. But I, I feel like scientists do the same way. They, they work 35 years and they don't want to put it out there right away so they do it in the next five years. And people have a problem with producing that because they don't know the details. Right, but now the for the, the to share themselves. But I, I understand where you're coming from. It's challenging to spend your whole career on, on something that you might have to be for the bigger picture better than you know, society. I just wanted to make a point about clinicaltrials.gov that I would just be bothered about. That um, essentially if you don't um, apply, there 